The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Hope Housing is championing the great Aussie dream for our everyday heroes, police, nurses, paramedics, teachers and more by reinventing the way they buy homes. Hope's shared equity housing model means your clients can now access the property investment returns they've come to love without the hassle of being a landlord and at the same time enabling affordable home ownership for a deserving frontline worker. It's the win-win Australia needs right now. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Rookley. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Rob Petrie from Acambo Financial Group today. Rob, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Pleasure. Hopefully the audio comes through today. We've had to patch together a bit of a recording studio here. We're recording on the phone voice memos, so apologies if the audio is not as great as it normally is. Rob, I wanted to get you on, uh, we are just talking before I press the record here, around this you kind of manage a team of advisors and I want to get into your roles at Acambo and what you do, how you got to there. But um, as I said, I think a lot of the people that I interview for for Ensemble, they're either small business owners, they might be sole practitioners, they might have a little bit of support staff, maybe they're growing and adding on a couple of advisors or they tend to be at the other end where they're an employee in a, in a financial planning business that might be of a reasonable size. But I think there's probably some gold in between your two years around around managing you know, growing teams of people. Can you maybe start with telling us a bit about what your role is in the Cambo, what you get up to? Yep, yep. So my role with the Cambo is to facilitate the relationships with the, our advisors, um, with our joint venture partners, where we actually walk in and assist them with their advice notes. Um, so we have a multifaceted angle of managing the relationship of, with a business owner, yes. but also then managing their relationship with the client, so, um, which is good fun <laughs> and um, uh, keeps us on our toes. From the advisor's perspective, we've got, uh, as you can appreciate, different personalities, different skill sets, um, and making sure that they're aligned with regards to uh, best interest duty and, and the needs of that, not only that business and that profile that they specialise in, but also the client mm-hmm. needs as well. Yeah. What, can you elaborate a bit more on this this idea of the kind of joint venture partners? Because until I got to know you and the Acambo business, uh, the, the the setup that you have, I think anyway, is, is probably a bit unique in, in in the market. What does it what does it look like? Where do your clients come from? How do you, how do you, how does the business work? So essentially, we partner with accounting practices, primarily with accounting practices who are looking for an advice solution, but don't necessarily want the um, the issues of managing an advisor or an advice running an advice business themselves. So we will come in and, and partner with them and work with the accountants, with clients, and making sure that we address their needs. So from an accountant's point of view, uh, they essentially get an advisor. In house, essentially, we can white label as the relevant accounting practice um, to provide the services. So it assists the accountants not only with their needs, but also around refencing their clients so they're not exposure to be um, basically uh, ripped away to another practice where they potentially may be exposed to a, a, a different accountant or different services. Yeah, was that something that that came out of the? The changes around the accountant's licensing from a few years ago, or was it already happening before then? We already it was already happening before then, yeah. but it accelerated with regards to the the change in licensing expectations. Okay. So from that perspective, there are a, a number of accounts that we're aware of where it's just become too hard. So they wanted to be self licensed or, or or remain licensed, but it's been too difficult. So yeah. we step in and assist with that void where that's played out. And how do the Come across the accounting firms to to you know to, to put the advisors into like where do they come from how do, how do you how do you stumble across an accountant 
Um, yeah, very fortunate that um, with regards to um, Anthony and Joe and then uh, David Pitt uh, from a leadership perspective that they have large profiles in the industry um, and through our different communities, um, we generally get approached to to actually understand what our solution is and then basically we'll, we'll walk in and see what their problem is and, and how we can solve to that particular problem. Yeah. So most of it is word of mouth, yeah, okay. um, and that that's probably where it primarily comes from. Yeah, because I think a lot of financial planners they they're always in trying to find the accountant that's going to refer work to them, but seem to be in a unique position where it sounds like they're coming to you rather than you going searching for them because of the network that you that's been built by the business over time. Yeah, I think a lot of that credit needs to go to the the original directors yeah. in terms of the amount of time and effort they've spent on building their profile with accounting practices, but also knowing what the right solutions are yeah. um, and, and establishing what those pain points are so that you can actually repeat them. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of, of our relationships are that you can come in at any point in time and, and but share our experience with other practices so you can accelerate some of those potential pitfalls or raise awareness to them, similar to a client relationship. Yeah, they they I and I think there's there's probably a, a degree of credibility given that you, you can go in there and say we you know we've done this in the past, we've done that, and you can show that experience that you've had exactly with client scenarios. Yes, yeah, so definitely. You, this isn't the first time that I've dealt with this problem or that we've had to come up with a solution for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or or better still, you know, there are three options we can we can put to the table to try and solve to this. Which one do you want to try? Yeah. yeah. And so prior to joining Acambo, what where were you? What what's your you know, your 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 story in financial advice? If I go back originally an advisor with the CBA, yeah. Um, did that for ten or ten or so years and then managed um, teams across Victoria and Tassie. Uh, for the CBA in terms of their financial planning mm. and then moved to Shadforth um, with a team there, about 40 odd advisors that was across Victoria and South Australia. Mm. Um, the, 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 the part that I enjoy more in terms of leading teams is actually coaching people to their potential. Yeah. Um, my most enjoyable aspects are working with um, grads um, and, and basically establishing what they want to to be and then helping them hit their full potential. Mm. So that's the fun part about what I do. So in terms of the leading teams, so how many how many advisors at Acambo are you responsible for in you know one one way, shape or form? What what does that look like? Uh at this point it's uh twelve. Okay. Twelve advisors who are basically work as a team and basically we're responsible for servicing not only the back book but also the new opportunities that, that and the new introductions that are abroad our way. Yeah. Um, so it's a relatively small team but uh, continually growing. So uh, you know, got some fairly high growth aspirations there. So um, if we keep growing at the same rate, then you know, that team will keep expanding. Yeah, but like 12 advisors in, I would imagine there's not that many businesses out there. It might be a handful, but it'd have to be at the upper end of, of, of financial advice businesses with a number of in-house employed financial advisors. There wouldn't be that many. Sure, I don't, I don't know the stats, but I wouldn't think there'd be too many like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not... I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. So, again, if I'm reflecting on working for large of institutions, you know, that it, I suppose it's all relative. So, the mm-hmm. previous team was 40-odd advisors. Yeah. Before that, it was 100-odd authorised reps. So, um, <laughs> relative terms. Yeah. And so, like, I wanted to kind of dive into this this idea of yeah, managing a team of 12 advisors. Kind of what processes and procedures and things do you have in place to – to be able to, as you, as you mentioned, trying to you know train and mentor and encourage these advisors to be the best version of themselves or whatever it is that they're aspiring to do. What have you got in place in your whether it's day to day, month to month? Like what what have you got in place? What processes to to try and help facilitate that? The the part where I probably default to is one on one time. Yeah, um, and I dedicate yeah you know, on a fortnightly basis uh, an hour to um, each of the advisors where. We talk about challenges or work on things that they want to develop. The aspect that I make sure that we have factored into to that discussion is more around the skills that they want to develop and less about the outcomes that they want to achieve. Mm. We'll make assumptions that 
uh, again, given the profession we work in, which is outcome driven, that people are pretty clear on their goals. Yeah. It's usually just making sure that we refine the skills along the way to, to make sure that they get there. Mm. I've I've found in the past, I'm interested in your your input in this. That you kind of, I have a similar you know one on one type session with different people in my team, and it can often, particularly talking to advisors, it can often go down the track of then you end up talking about a particular client scenario and I was, no. and you end up maybe workshopping a particular client scenario and that that's beneficial in the moment but trying to take a step back to you know, progressing them and, and developing them more than just dealing with this one client scenario how do yeah. you how do you deal with that I, I think the key there is just making sure that you don't get suck it into the the thought process or validating the thought process and and in terms of framing like I'll, I'll if i'm working with you james i'll, I'll frame with you that uh, you're going to present a problem you're going to present a situation even if i agree with your situation i'm going to take an opposing view just to make sure that we've got our perspective from other other angles mm. so and continuing to make sure that i'm agile enough to to flick around and take a different stance at different times. Yeah. I think that that aspect, but having really clear parameters that people can work with it, it's like, because you, know, you and I deal with the same client, we'll have totally different solutions. We could achieve their goal. Okay. It's no different. And and the, the part that we're all attracted to is that agility to use our minds. Mm. So making sure that there's not just one way um, and and making people aware of that, but being really clear on the parameters, like from a um, a, a regulatory perspective, making sure that those bumpers are there, yeah, and that they stay inside there. But you've got the autonomy to play, okay. Um, and early on, you know, uh, when coaching and when working with advisors, feeling that you know there's only one way, I found that really prohibitive. Uh, that's where I get pleasure out of working with newer people to our profession because they have an open mind or they haven't uh, stumbled across as many obstacles before. So they don't have preconceived ideas of what can and can't work. Mm. And better still, they could probably execute on an idea that I I failed at, uh, but because they're smarter than me, they might find a better way or an alternate way to make that work. Yeah. You you mentioned about this kind of some some pretty aggressive growth aspirations and and in that in the time that I've known you you seem to absolutely execute on it how do you how do you find new advisors to um to to kind of fill that that growth trajectory how do you how do you find them and what is it that you're, that you're looking for because there's thousands of advisors out there yeah i i find that probably the hardest part of the role yeah uh, in terms of finding them uh, again at different stages, you have different philosophies. Early on in my career, I looked for the best advisor that I could find. Mm. But now I look for um, someone who brings something different to the team and, and looking for those points of difference or looking at the team and going, what are we lacking? Mm. Um, and from that point of view, yeah, but I've still got aspects of uh, some diversity within the team that that I haven't been able to nail yet. Um, and, and again, it's... It's one of those progressive things, a lot to do with timing as well. Yeah. You know, our timing may not be appropriate for someone else's. Um, you know, I've still got a couple of people that I'm really interested in working with in the future, uh, but at this stage, they, they're they working at other firms. Yeah, okay. So, but um, periodically, I'll just raise my head and <laughs> in their in their messages and drop them a line just to see how they're going. Yeah. Always got your eye out, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I think again, the beauty of uh, a larger firm that that we represent is that I'm very reliant on on networks and relationships. Mm. I think making sure that you get people who can uh, fit into a culture or fit into an environment and want to be there. Mm. You know, the two most recent hires um, they approached uh, a Cambo uh, um, from a historical perspective in terms of been watching our our journey and and interested in what that looks like Mm. and that progressed to them now joining the team. So from that point of view, that's a pretty good fit. Yeah. Um, But also, yeah, solid grounding in terms of where they've been. Do you have anyone in the team going through professional year? Like I've got one starting professional year in a couple of weeks. Yep. Yeah. So that's- Is that in the client service, someone that's in client services team? Where where do they sit at the moment? 
client services, but yep. we'll move them into an associate role. So yeah, uh, now that's probably the area where our advisors have probably been a little bit more hands-on or our, our client services team have been a little bit more at that crossover journey. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to create something in between so that we have that um, succession plan more in play. Yeah, and so most of the advisors you hire, at least for the moment, they've got a couple of years' experience somewhere else. Most they might be early on in their career. They might yep. not have been advising for fifteen years, but they but their advisors elsewhere. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, from, from because of our um, our solutions that we deal with, there's a you know I'm looking for someone who has an interest in the the share market in particular because of the investment solutions that we provide. Uh, I need someone who can actually have that conversation and wants to have that conversation as opposed to exclusively a managed fund. So from that point of view, because of the accountants and some of the, um, we we run a retail and a wholesale business. Mm -hmm. So we've got a fair bit of diversity there in terms of those conversations. That's not all just to the strategic side. It can be, get quite heavy in the investment side. Okay. And how does the relationship with the accountants work? We we always spoke before about you, you, there's you know, a whole range of accounting partners that you have, and and you know knowing you they're right across the country. We're in Melbourne, but they're they're right across the country. So how does that how does that work in terms of the accountants' relationship with the Acambo financial advisors? Are they lined up? You know, James is the the financial advisor for this accounting firm, or is it more of a the accountant puts the hand up and says, hey, we've got this client that looks like this. And then with your mix of different skills that you have in your team, you're trying to match them up with the right advisor. How does that work? Yeah, I, I try and align an advisor initially with the accounting firm from the point of view of it's a relationship business, so I need to make sure that they gel. Yep. And from that point of view, generally speaking, it will be more than one advisor so that they have choice there. And I will choose uh, two advisors who are, have some similarities, but also some differences, yeah. so that they stand out that way. Yeah. You know, and it's not um, what I'm looking for from the accounting point of view is consistency in terms of how we deliver to them, um, and then the personality component becomes the the deciding factor to, for them. Where it, if if it's not working, it's generally because um, we deliver inconsistently. Um, so solving to that problem is the biggest issue from my perspective that that we we saw, we we face, which is more around if you walk into a practice and you do one thing, and I walk in the next day I do something different. We, we're going to call out, get called out on the points of difference as opposed to the similarities around client experience. Yeah, and and, and kind of to to that, do you, have you experienced in the past? An, an accountant, if you're, you know, that you're putting two advisors in front of them in, in, in one way, shape, or form, them gravitating more to one towards the other. Does, does that happen from time to time? Yeah, always. Yeah, always. And how do you deal with that? Do you end up putting a different advisor in there? Like, what what happens in that relationship if if the accountant's gravitating towards one person and seemingly like only wants to deal with with one of the advisors in that relationship? Yeah, because it's about the client, like I'll generally manage the the number of clients that we've got on the go um, at any point in time. So the client experience and the brand is important. So in, in that type of scenario, I'd, I'd be coaching the account to the the point that, hey, uh, James has got a lot of opportunities on the go. It's going to take a long time to get through those. From that perspective, this could be a bad, a bad experience for your client, which could ultimately impact your brand. Mm got another advisor here, you know, um, let's tap the brakes in terms of some opportunities to that advisor and let's make sure we balance that out. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, that That's my preferred approach. Doesn't always, not always well received because again, it, it's a it's a relationship business as I've already said. Yeah. Uh, but but just making sure that we do that and that's where it becomes really important around the, the, the closeness of those relationships. I've got a a couple of advisors who work with one of our large practices, and they do that that exceptionally well. Mm. Um, I've got another relationship where um, I've probably got advisors who are too extreme, and, and from that point of view, I, I need to bring them both in, yeah. and, and just having those conversations with them around awareness of this is how you're perceived, or this is how your message is being received, and then just trying to coach them to somewhere in the middle. And what what type of capacity? You know, restraints or or, or 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 expectations do you do you set for your advisors? I know, I know you 
you operate, you know, so, so some, some advice practices work on a, we want advisors to look after X number of revenue. Yeah. And then there's other practices that, that, that look at it from a, we want clients, we want advisors to look after X number of clients or do this number of initial client meetings a week, this number of reviews, it's a, yeah. might be really regimented. What, what type of capacity measures do you have around the advisors? Yeah, we we run a two speed model, which is a, a, a new business model and a, and a retention model. Uh, from our you know, new business advisors, they'll generally hold somewhere around seventy clients at the top end, with a view to making sure that they've got capacity to grow and capacity to do business development, which is supporting the accountants in terms of what their endeavours are. Yep. Um, from that perspective, that allows them to move quickly. Uh, from my experience, the, the amount of time that it takes to bring on a new client is considerably more than what it is to service an existing client, and that's the rationale behind them holding lower numbers is that because it, 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 it will be a considerably larger piece of work to assist a client with onboarding and implementing their initial advice. Yeah, and where's the... Where's the line in the sand for that? You know that that more new business oriented advisor. Where's that line in the sand where you're starting to say, okay, you've got you've got too many. Either do, do they then rotate to be a servicing advisor, or do they hand off? Like what 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 happens? Yeah, uh, working to that. There are different scenarios at play, and there's no one one size fits all. Mm. The, the approach that I think works the best is going into a meeting where uh, you present a team. And I present two advisors to you as my client. Yeah. Um, and essentially during that presentation, um, the advisor who has the more appropriate skills to look after your needs going forward will take the lead on that. Usually that would be a servicing advisor because their aspect of retention and their nurture component uh, it is probably their skill and, and more um, aligned with what they want to achieve. Uh, which is help people through their goals. Yeah. Um, so that handoff process early on, generally at the original statement of advice presentation, uh, that would be predetermined at that point or determined at that point mm. with a view to setting that they're making sure that the client is aligned to that new advisor. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So, you, so it's not a not necessarily a model where someone builds up a client base and then they. Now, I've had a relationship with you, the client, for three or four years, and then all of a sudden I'm turning around to you saying, oh, I need to move you on to a different advisor. That The, the, the servicing advisor is trying to be introduced as early on in that relationship as possible. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's still a work in progress. Mm. And again, you know, that clients, yeah, that they need to gel with their advisor, so it won't always uh, be that way. And sometimes, um, you know, we, we all enjoy clients and we enjoy certain clients that we want to work with. Yeah. So I've got some advisors who want to hold on to clients that they <laughs> they adore, they appreciate, and they want to see those through. Uh, and they can do that, but it's only up to a certain number yeah. and making sure that they can still actually, that they've got a different skill set, which is that ability to influence clients at the start of their advice journey. Uh, that's a very different skill to, to retention. Yeah. Um, so making sure that we get that right. And that that's a that's if I reflect on you know my last few years, I reckon that's probably the hardest part that I've faced as an advisor myself. This handy clients over to someone else. Yeah, I've had to do it a few times, and we'll we'll need to continue to do it going forward. But then every now and then, like because with a lot of clients know each other, like you get these neighbor every now and then. The the advisor that's taken over, they they say, oh, such and such mentioned that. Uh, you know they know you're they know James you're still looking after their friend but I've been moved on to someone else and they yeah. they don't feel great about it which then in turn makes me not feel great about it that's that's the hardest part that I deal with is uh, I need to do it but 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 doing it in a way I don't know that I feel comfortable with it's it's, it's always the challenge my, my, my advice to that scenario to help with that thought process I, um, if I take the recent um, new members to the team, hmm. They've actually got better skills in the areas for the, these clients that we're, we're going to move from one advisor to the next. They're actually more appropriate to deal with them mm. because they can specialise in that area. And from our perspective, I'm more comfortable that a, the client will get a better outcome by dealing with them. Now, if, if I'm looking at you, you have a very diverse skill set and 
you um, you work with clients with vast ranges of, of problems. Mm. Okay, uh, where we get to the servicing side, if we choose someone who specialises in a particular area, and we can actually make sure that they are dealing with someone who deals with that problem day in day out, I think they'll get a better outcome. Yeah. So from that framing perspective, I wouldn't feel guilt. I'd I'd go, hey, my skills are a bit superficial over here. No disrespect intended. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've actually the, the good news is we've just hired an advisor who specialises in that area, and they will ensure that you get the best possible outcome based on your circumstances. Yeah, yeah. That's a bit to work on, isn't it? Yeah. So where to? Where to from here? Where to f- for you? Where to? Where to for the team? What are your plans for the year? Uh, all things being equal, well, the, the team will continue to grow. So um, if we work to client numbers hmm. in terms of uh, my my mantra is that um, each client requires about the same amount of time to to understand and to service. Therefore, we work to client numbers. Yep. As the client numbers continue to grow, that's the catalyst for us to continue to, to expand the team. Uh, and make sure that we're working through those areas. Mm. Um, the commitment from my perspective to the broader business is from a succession plan point of view that I'll, I'll look to develop a couple of individuals from within um, our broader business and give them an opportunity to be an advisor nice. um, in the not too distant future. Um, and outside of that, I, I probably still need to bring in one more advisor in the next 12 months um, to complement the team in terms of... Uh, an area that I think we're probably a little bit soft on. Is there a, is there a, like an end target of we would like to have fifteen advisors servicing this n- many clients, or is it just, just if it's fifteen, sixteen, seven, and it's just keep growing? If it, there's the, the the growth is the is the goal rather than the there's no end, like like there's no end in sight. You want to understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> I, I don't think there's an end in sight. You know, yeah. Working in our profession for a number of years, I think there are so few Australians who get good quality advice. The goal is to get more uh, more Aussies in front of a good advisor and make sure that we're solving to their, their needs and getting them to a better financial position. That, that's the goal. And until that, uh, that number starts to get to, you know, something more substantial where we've got confidence that people are being guided through their advice journey um, as opposed to transactional advice, I I think we've still got a massive way to go. So few advisors left in terms of our population. It's a pretty good good position to be in. It it is. I guess so then the building blocks of that is more more accountants in the network, your, 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 your partners, which then... There's more clients that need helping. You fill back fill that with more advisors and just keep growing. Yeah, I, I think the the opportunity is at the moment uh, from from our perspective, we're we're probably a lot more reactive than proactive. I think there's a proactive side of the equation where we could um, do a better job of of uh, educating and articulating the benefit we could provide to people. At this stage, we do a great job when people go. Do you know have a financial advisor? Can you help me? And we do a fantastic job there. Yeah. But it's the people who are unaware that they could benefit. That's that's something that we need to start to solve to a bit better. Do you have any ideas? Like, is that you know, just to, there's the classic seminars and things trying to try to run events for for the accountants that are referring work into you. Like, do you do that already, or, or is you know, do you have any ideas? Is here how, how do you how do you make it more you're making people known about you rather than people asking for you. Yeah, I'd probably defer to you on that one because I think you're doing a better job <laughs> of that than I am. Um, but probably that awareness of the strategic value of dealing with an advisor yeah. is undersold and too many people gravitate to the return yeah. and what that looks like. Mm. And I think strategically we add considerable value, but I think... The part that I haven't solved to, and I don't think our profession has, is getting to people early enough. Give us five to seven years with someone before they're going to retire, and you can change their life yeah. considerably. Yeah. Give us ten to fifteen years before they retire, and, and you can turn them into anything if they're if they're working with you closely enough. Versus someone that walks in, they open the doors. I retired yesterday, and it's 
just trying to make the best use of what they happen to have in front of them. Yeah, yeah. Realistically, you know, if someone comes in and says, I'm retiring in six weeks, you know, we're just going to place them respectfully. We're going to, we can't change that outcome mm. in terms of what they've got, but give us a few years and through just that discipline of guidance, wow, it's, it's such a privileged position that we have. Mm. Um, and I, I'd love to see us getting involved in, in people's lives earlier. So, Rob, thanks for joining me this morning to record this. For, for anyone that's interested, maybe advisors in particular, given the growth prospects and you're saying you're looking for other advisors, where can people find you to you know, follow along, have a coffee with you? Where can they where can they get in touch? Yeah, uh, Rob at a cambofg.com. <laughs> so hit the website um, and just yell out if you think uh, you want to have a chat or if you think we can help. You're on LinkedIn as well, so we'll put some um, some links to your profile and stuff. And uh, in the show notes, wherever you might be listening to this, I'll publish it on uh, on LinkedIn shortly. Yeah, Rob, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. See ya.